So PhD thesis is just a document, and um, very often um, nobody looks at it after it's published. Very few PhD thesis are cited. Um, but what is cited is their main publication. I feel that our former PhD students are in a different league in that not all, but significant majority of them have done core innovation. That is also, and of course, the PhD is, this, this is built upon their core papers. You notice uh, if you go to uh, this, um, let me see, I can, if this will work or not. So, so reaching that that level of uh, you know um, now um, I think about yeah but screen is not being shared with the people on it. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> there's too many complaints. <laughs> Online and offline. So anyway, so I was sharing with people, um, we used to be at uh, this so-called noises. And, um, you know, this was another huge achievement while I'm at Italy. So this screenshot is um, for top organizations in World Wide Web, which, okay. And Wright State University was listed at the seventh place in the entire world. So you had Google, you had IBM research, you had, um, or, you know, some of the top companies, then you have, uh, I think probably Stanford or something was there. But practically in terms of universities, we were the, you know, that high. Can you understand, you know, I mean, look at the significance in the entire world, among all the organizations, companies and universities, we were at seventh place position in terms of publication impact. This is Microsoft Academic Search. Right, so that's quite a bit, and we are at a second tier university. Right, so this is the, uh, and, and I'm also saying that because you need to be prepared for doing the same, continue or, uh, you know, that legacy. So, um, And uh, by not even continuing the website, right state lost all the free thing that they could have had. But anyway, mm -hmm. it. okay. So um, after doing that, what I want to do is so, after, so he will go um, and probably you don't have to prepare anything for that class, but I want you to. Uh, do the following. I want you to uh, go to our vision page. Our vision page is at AIISC.ai slash vision. And um, so what I have done typically is to drive my research and our group's research through 
placing the bets you know meaning running it by through some vision so it's not arbitrary reason why we are you guys are doing what you guys are doing right i don't do exact steering i don't think you but i so you will go on this path then your own vehicle will go on the path and you know reach wherever it does and um and from time to time, I have, uh, you know, written about it ahead of the time that we do a bunch of work. So one of the area of vision, um, uh, you know, particularly that, that was important in um, the academic journey was the vision of competing for human experience. And I want you to read that. There is a video of a talk I gave at the um, uh, I've given some keynotes on that. Unfortunately, they were not recorded. But I gave a talk at the uh, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign's um, supercomputing center uh, director's um, talk. And um, I want you to listen to that. But more importantly, I want you to read the vision paper that is there. When you read the vision paper, there is a box item. So when you write IEEE Internet Company or other articles, you can put it in the box. And there I have given links to some of the very influential visions that um, uh, you know have come over the period of time so i just want to show that we'll discuss this more but uh let's see if this is oh okay this one the influential and interesting works that led to to the competing for human experience. So how my own vision was formed of the always building upon other giants work. So this is whenever Bush is saying as I talked about all the time, uh, from devices to unbeat intelligence and so on and so forth. There are many others that you want to I want you to look at. Right? And I want you to really understand this because this is what has driven um, some of the insights into the work we have done. And, and there are many, uh, uh, what you may call, um, these are others' work, right? These are, oh, these are others' work. Okay. okay. My, my view point is here. This is my, uh, you know, uh, vision. And I said that these are, there are other influential, uh, you know, visions that I have had chance to indirectly benefit from. Um, uh, there's a lot more, but we, uh, so what I'm going to do is that um, uh, they're going to be, uh, that is one, and the second one is this one here, semantic cognitive and perceptual computing. Okay. Uh, and um, so in this one, also, as you go, uh, there is a uh, ITV computer article, and there is a um, you know a keynote uh, that is uh, yeah there should be it should be probably a minute here this keynote okay. so what I want to do is that I want you to form two groups one will do computing for human experience other will do semantic community personality. I want you to both deeply read and I want you to have this group members meet and actually discuss and then come prepared to present uh, these ideas. And I want you to uh, show that you are PhD students, not master students, not bachelors. So I don't want to hear what I said there. I want, uh, it's like you read a book and then you are going to present a, an interpretation, right? Some many interpretation of book and even a critic, critic. So, yeah I, I agree with this i don't agree or i found this thing here of course you need to keep in mind when they were published so you know um you know symbolic ai were not there when these things were written as an example and so you can say yeah you know i see the flavor of this here or not or i see flavor of this in this new thing that has come but i don't that's fine whatever you do and it is not necessary, and you have to learn when you do PhD research, you can't, you're not just reading that paper, 
you are reading the citations that the paper has and to some level you have to go through some citations now a paper may have 40 citations and you don't have time to read all the 40 papers but you're going to at least know the title and then pick a couple of them to say these are i don't have a background in this so i should read that or here's another complimentary thing i should look that way so to that level you need to demonstrate the curiosity and uh, ability to gain broader perspective for example the uh, computing of human experience was followed by my other sort of a limited vision called um, uh, uh, physical social cyber physical cyber social computing and in uh, the article i had read that um, i don't know 100 200 300 cite, some citations um but that is a derivation of the complete for human experience knowledge infused learning is a derivation of this thing here for the refinement or for you know basically as the world moved as i saw other people you know uh when i wrote some of these things i had um where, you know uh, i had exposure to traditional machine learning but not you know how the deep learning the uh, thing i was not the uh, you know was not involved in the 2012 2013 time frame but i then i observed it and then i you know say what is good from there so um i want you to really present something uh, that is value add on that so that would be your uh, thing and and we'll see uh, as uh, i would like to see uh, um uh, when i give this keynote um um including award winner raj 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 raj, huh? raj, raj. raj was uh, in the first lower uh, so he and i were the main uh, keynote speakers so i went on the first day he went on the second day and he liked it so much that he went and talked about my work when he visited ibm and he sent a uh, you know ceo and other people of his company that he advised say go and meet and see eventually they did not you know figure out the way to use these ideas but uh, the point is that at least um, um you know people who are um who you, you look up to um rajadi was in a way person that i would look up to when i came to us um uh, i remember visiting and uh, participating at a workshop in uh, cmu he's been professor at cmu for many many years and uh, you know um, but amazing personality. Anyway, uh, so uh, we'll go back. And uh, can a uh, couple of you guys join so that you can help me find the work? So I want you to find um, the CIKM paper uh, uh, by Vipul Kashyap and me, um, nine, uh, 1994. Can you find that? And if so, project it here. If there is a figure in that, I want to uh, I want to discuss that figure. The information broken. Yeah. Paste the link in the Someone has shown. Not that group. Okay. The Google chat. Uh, oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, uh, is this open? Are you going to see the paper? Yes, you can click on the PDF. Sure. Open the paper. So, this is a, a there's a 1993 Rutgers report, technical report, and this is a, a subset of that in a paper form. 
1990, the same year I started in Kohanes. So the um, the idea of information brokering, there were three influential ideas um, in my view, and of course it's a very biased viewpoint. The idea of um, uh, mediators uh, done by um, um, Geo Witherhold. Uh, Gio uh, uh, was a research professor at Stanford last, but he was also the advisor of um, Hector Garcia Molina. Uh, Hector Garcia Molina was, got his PhD from, uh, from Princeton in 1985, I believe, or so. No, 1979 or so. And Gio was, uh, I think, an advisor. And uh, he was on distributed data management. And my thesis followed that where <clears throat> I added the heterogeneity component. Hector passed away due to cancer. <clears throat> Sorry, guys, I need to. <coughs> Can you stop this? Uh, sorry, pause this. Uh, no, on the list, first option was recording. On, on the right, on the right. So, um, okay, sir, uh, what is information broken? I don't know. Huh? What is information broken? A website or a database has some information to. And the, an application or user needs some information. Okay. The information somebody needs comes from multiple sources. Part comes from here, part comes from here, part comes here. In a simple distributed database context, part here comes and then you join with something here. That is a very rigid sort of information it it is based on you know rows of information available, then you get it. In a broadly, the information can be in any form, in any database, not the same database, or on a web page, or something else. For your information that you seek, how do you find who has what information, bring it all, collect together, and deliver it? So, this is that core issue of semantic proximity that other things have. The role of a domain model, the context, the semantic proximity idea, and uh, see the real world versus model world. I've discussed those ideas earlier, so I won't go into that now. How do you bring uh, information from multiple sources within the compatible context? And here is that picture. Where you say, here's information source one, information source two, and that uh, you have, um, each of them are creating, uh, creating their own context. So they have their own ontology or vocabulary. Then the user has a different one. So um, how do you say what user wants, understand the differences or similarity between the 
uh, ontology, uh, you know, uh, of the model, and then find the data, convert that, and give it to the user. That's a broad idea. This is 1993 Federation of Ontology. First paper that recognizes that there's no one ontology, there are multiple ontologies, and that each, uh, you know, a repositories can have their own ontologies, different from even the user one. So this was the first paper that recognized that. Remember, I talked. This is 1993-94, the first use of on the, the, the um, uh, um, uh, this is a dissertation from Stanford or from that the guy who did information intelligence and interface, the CD inventor. What is the name? Tom Gruber. Tom Gruber. So it's that recent, right? Also, in the context of innovation, what I will share is that you need to keep aware of that. This was not even, this was very early phase. We didn't have even a, uh, you know, web per se, uh, fully, you know, working web. And even that time to be aware of a work of others is something. So similarly, you have to work hard to keep up with what everybody else in your, uh, in your area of interest are doing. Now, this idea of having this uh, uh, family ontology, look at the influence of that work. I will show you here. This one, thousand citation, observer an approach for query progress processing in global information system based on interoperation across pre-existing ontologies. So, you know, there's a quite a bit, so very core idea in that paper, 1994, work continued until 2000. Uh, there are other, uh, and so what happened was that there was this guy named Mena, he uh, was doing PhD in uh, Spain, but spent two years with me, started working with Vipul. Um, uh, you know, this Arunza uh, was her adv uh, his advisor, but she didn't contribute anything. <laughs> Maybe just uh, because she was the advisor. Anyway, so um, the complexity in information and the you know role of semantics, how people model things. Uh, those are you know these are the years where people used to think about it. All these ideas remain remain very relevant today. One interesting observation is that in the whole area of data centric computer science, perhaps one topic on which every over the years highest amount of um, investment is made. Is that of integration, information integration. The information has always been distributed in different literature forms, and bringing them together has always been um, a problem that has vexed scientists for a very long time. It's never been solved because of uh, new and new types of heterogeneity coming into the picture. So, first we solve this problem, address this problem in the area of schema integration. Uh, and the work in those uh, influential work in that was done in 1980s. So in 1987, I had the first project in the US on schema integration, and it was second project in the world. There was one project uh, before we did in the um, theory, at a th this conceptual level, not even. Uh, uh, and so they had not talked about. They had talked about it, but not really progressed a whole lot. And then in Spain, then we had a project when I was at Unisys. And uh, then we followed it up with a project called Braid at uh, uh, Honeywell, um, not Honeywell, at, at Belcourt. Anyway, then um, th th those were the days of uh, database integration, schema integration and database integration, where database integration means instance of data also included. But then type of data kept on changing. In those days, you used to worry about taking the data and putting it in the database. When the web came, with HTTP, you can get to any type of object. You can get 
to image, you can get to a video, you can get to a, a, you know text, you can get to a database. And uh, you know, and the dynamic uh, you know querying where you're sending a query, which is a query or database that produces the uh, you know sort of record and delivers it. And the database can be continuously updated. Again, those are the issues that came. So the data types kept on changing. So the integration the things uh, you know uh, challenges kept on increasing. That continues now. Then came sensor data and all kinds of different. on abstraction like people have different own definitions on the abstraction but according to our group what i understand is totally different like what do you think people have these different uh, different definitions on abstraction you see these different uh, definitions are bound to have and then they are bound to um, 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 uh, and then somebody, somebody's work gets much more recognized, and everybody follows that. I'll give you the example right here. Where is that paper uh, that was uh, did I close it? Okay, now, um, if you read this, the object here could be any object, including a web page or a database. Now, when you have a web page and you have metadata of that page and you uh, provide access to the data from any source, that is semantic web. That is, you know, I mean, a person coming from database will use and trying to publish in a database conference would use a particular terms. But underlying meaning is that you have a variety of objects, different models for uh, representing those objects, metadata for objects because you have that model, and using that uh, you know intermediation and uh, presenting the results. Uh, the core idea of um, so so and, and we call this semantic information brokering. In nineteen uh, ninety nine. Tim Bonesley, in his book, writes, uses the word semantic web, saying that the web page would have metadata which will provide semantics. So that I'll call this semantic web. That's about it. So there's no fundamental difference. But the difference is a, a big difference. There's a big difference. The person who said that is Tim Bonesley, who is recognized as the uh, inventor of the web. And he used a very good word term, semantic web. And he limited to the web. He didn't go, we said one of them can be a web page. And we can also have something else, which is true. We can. This is what core idea behind info harness was also, you know, was the case. Not limited to web, but databases also coexist. Why not? So it is even more advanced and more demanding. And he used a very attractive term. And he's him honestly. So the you know uh, everything got uh, you know uh, everybody saw the value of it, and then that is the word that the the other two options are the uh, mediator and the information brokering. They were not you know as you know recognized per se. Only a few people who understood these said. They recognize it. But it's one thing to reach the audience to writing a paper that goes to a database conference. This was CIKM. Another thing to publish a book that 
thousands of people read and I have the you know keynote at World War conference uh, and and or actually found you know, he started the World War conference as also and have that uh, way to talk about it. So this is where in our own way now I, I can't be Tim Bursley, right? But in our way, then what we do is to write these articles that have been quite influential. Many of them have at least 50, 100 plus citations. And uh, we put it up. Anyway, uh, we want to just recognize that this is the work uh, that we pulled in. Let's move on. Okay. Now I'm not going to talk about. By the way, you can you may it will be worthwhile to look at their uh, you know LinkedIn page and what where they are now. I want to talk about Zongilio. He worked on business processes. George Cardoso, quality of service and semantic composition of workflows. He his work is very well cited. I think more than 5,000 citations. Um, his work on quality of services, I think about well over 1,000 citations, 100 some citations. Kunal. So Kunal uh, became, well, at one point was among the top 10 um, cited researcher in worldwide web, entire worldwide web. At that time, I was listed at one position, but think about it, the student at five, six, eight place uh, is quite a bit of, uh, you know, uh, so he did, so his work really got um, exceptional uh, play because the area of uh, web services and web processes was hot for quite some time. I delivered a number of my students worked on that, but I recognized that the work had become uh, more engineering centric. So at one point I had the um, largest or second largest group in the world in the work workflow area, and in fact, a second largest project in the workflow area. And then I also did in 2007, I also, uh, no, not sorry. In 1997, I started a company called InfoHarness. By, so the, there's a project called Meteor, managing end-to-end -end processes. And follow process called Meteor S, which is semantic version of that. And there are four types of semantics really defined. And it became, um, um, uh, uh, a, 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 and uh, the, one of the thing was uh, that we proposed this visual S, which became as a visual, the whole world standard, which I've talked about before. He worked in, in the context of Mina as well. Kartik, I just recently introduced Kartik to somebody. Uh, who, who did I introduce Kartik to? Okay, on LinkedIn. Kartik, uh, he, you know, um, has. Um, um, is the uh, head of applied machine uh, applied AI at uh, this company called Causely? Yeah. So to to uh, uh, Utkarshni, uh, I made the connection. Now he did very interesting work, and um, I want to probably show you one or two, just one one uh, item of his work. Uh, So you can see it's uh, author of uh, 
So the first, uh, you know, this is an interesting paper called Discovering Informative sub Connections Subgraphs in Multi-Relational Graph. And um, you have a graph, and how do you find a meaningful graph? Uh, you have, let's say, a Wikipedia graph, and how do you make connection between various or you know nodes in Wikipedia graph to answer a complex query? So, um, he, uh, 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 this well-known author called Brown. Uh, he wrote about some history in Egypt or something. And uh, some society, some secret society, and there's some members. So I think there's a very interesting, it will take me some time, so I won't go into uh, the details. Uh, I, 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 uh, but um, essentially making um, connections between the objects and finding, discovering interesting path from a graph or information discovery. That is the class of work that he did that is very interesting. And then he developed this taxa minor. Given a corpus, develop a, a, a taxonomy. Learn a taxonomy from corpus. That work, class of work was in a, you know, further carried out by Christopher Thomas, who developed um, a tool called Loser. So you give a bunch of keywords, you know, go to Wikipedia and extract a, uh, a, a taxonomy, which was then used for uh, human performance cognition ontology, if, some of, if you've been exposed to that work, which was used by Schooner. And um, uh, in some sense, uh, And this, oh, okay. So you said, uh, I think in the morning I was talking about Kemafor did the work on ranking, remember? And there's another work that is this one. And I said, uh, uh, Alemen Meza. Actually, Alemen was not formally my student, he was a student of <coughs> um, Budak, who was my postdoc, and then uh, I got him hired at. Uh, uh, at the University of Georgia. So, and so these are some things, uh, uh, and this work is, was very interesting. Um, in this work, we talked about implicit, which is, I said, use of machine learning for search. Google example. Formal, which I basically say symbolic computation. And powerful, where we say that we need more powerful model like probabilistic model. And um, it shows how they are complementary, but uh, they both need to be used together. You know, symbolic. Of course, those words are not there. Neuro was not there. The statistical, this is traditional machine learning, not neural net, but the neural net is still data driven process, symbolic computation, and uh, others. Pramod Anantram pursued this by, because he used the Indian dynamical system, a powerful, uh, you know, probably graph model. So um, I do encourage you to at least scan these paper. Um, fairly early ideas on uh, the need for coexistence. You see, in this year 19, year 2000 to 2005, uh, the semantic web uh, community was flourishing. Uh, but the community was uh, uh, dominated by the faction that came from description logic. Uh, and uh, Jim Handler was the uh, leader of that. 
<clears throat> and uh, I never saw, I had done lodging myself. I had a paper in, I, I had a $1.6 million DARPA project called AI Database Integration in 1987, 88, uh, when I was at Unisys, where we have database and we have uh, uh, interpreted to compile, prolog to compile called LDL system uh, for AI processing. Those are the days of LISP uh, computers and all. And um, anyway, I won't go into that right now uh, too far off, but um, um, the Symmetric Web community uh, is, had a smaller fraction which was more applied uh, or application driven and practical and that uh, believed much more on the uh, uh, rdf sparkle link data while the uh, logic base were not going to out and correctness of noise representation and all those kind of formal aspects of it now my company had start, started long before right 1999 the tali semantics so I understood that I that um, the logic based framework is not going to scale. I had myself written a uh, my first job, Honeywell. Uh, my uh, first project was um, writing about thousand lines of prolog code. If anybody's written code, <laughs> writing prolog code of that size is unbelievable. To uh, implement MRP, manufacturing resource planning uh, system, uh, for um, uh, in prolog. Uh, and I, you know, it's just not scalable thing. And then I, in 1988, I had a project to write uh, expert system. I wrote an expert system for uh, chrome plating of aircraft, military aircraft landing gear. So, uh, you know, aircraft landing gear have chrome plating and uh, the process of chrome plating is very finicky. It has, has to be ideal condition for chromium to uh, uh, cover the metal, chromium would uh, make sure the rust does not, the thing does not rust. So for chromium to control, you know, uh, go around iron and, uh, you know, pro uh, protect it, uh, spread very routinely and not shaft, not, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of come out, uh, not become uneven is a very, uh, so there are a lot of rules there. So reading a book, uh, I wrote uh, a bunch of rules to do that. But uh, through that, all that, I got a sense that what is the, you know, how, how far you can take this along. And then I was not a big believer in that. So I became, uh, you know, very much into the practical aspect of semantic web. The semantic web of all in all is practically died by now. But it's there, some people still work and all that. Even the ISWC and all that, you hardly see. Uh, you know, many papers in those areas. So we did the practical aspects of it. And, um, uh, uh, and anyway, I mean, I knew from the company where I had to scale to, you know, web, web search engine has, has to have very large scale. So there we, did, um, we realized that uh, RDS centric graph thing is the best you can do. But I've become also in the process much more believer, not, you know, so, um, there is a power of um, you know traditional database and record level things. When you can do set related operations, operations is very you know hyper you know can perform very well. But when you have to model at that level uh, representation at the way at the level at which humans think and do, I want a richer model. And for that, I feel that um, um, the logic model and all is too rigid. Uh, too few people can understand it, a uh, lot more manual. So I found, um, you know, RDF level, RDFS level to be the happy ground. And that's why much of the work, uh, practical work we did was all around those things. I want to make this side remark that I, if you're not made, so if you look at the um, uh, advertisement, uh, the, the, the post about uh, Bosch is uh, uh, Bosch is looking for, um, in terms in neuroscience and look at the requirements, you will you will you will see um, you know uh, the mention of RD, RDF and uh, things of the nature. So uh, uh, I may you know in the past I have taught classes on semantic web and 
there are a lot of good lectures online. So please, you know, find the time to review them if you want to play in this area, uh, because it's going to continue to be uh, relevant. And when you're talking about neuro symbolic part, the symbolic part, uh, practical, um, the likelihood of the model that we use for symbolic part would be uh, RDF centric kind of thing. Uh, because graphs are going to be used more and more often, triples and graphs, uh, as opposed to uh, unstructured text alone. I mean, as an intermediate. So, in some cases, you still remain just the corpus and the text, and you're going through cracks and run your transform model. But in other cases, you're going to bring them to somewhat of a structured form before you process it further. And so, uh, you know, you want to uh, uh, pay attention. So this was, I think, very interesting and very much uh, something you need to uh, look at. So if you can RDF, find that. RDF is the ugly work of knowledge graph, isn't it? Like, they have also the triples, subject, predicate, and the logic. It's not actually, yeah. Subject, or it is triple, that is the foundation, right? In the RDF. And yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, the RDF has a particular syntax and number of idiosyncrasies. So, for example, there is a, a two fundamental, you know, um, what you call all, uh, two alternatives. One is the RDF, other is property graph uh, in terms of representation, uh, you know, and there are pros and cons of both of them. So, um, property graph is what many database centric highly scalable thing uh, you know uh, uh, efforts do and rdf is where there's a more little bit more uh, richness of modeling uh, but correspondingly uh, rdf pure rdf databases don't scale that well so there's a lot more you know computational demand and indexing is complex and all those things and reification those kind of stuff happen so um, um there are a whole bunch of uh, semantic web uh, uh, databases uh, that are available. Uh, Virtuoso is one as an example. Uh, there is uh, Franz is another one and so on and so forth. They are all uh, uh, Neo4j. They're all different uh, in terms of this model. They are somewhat related, uh, but uh, there are pros and cons of both. But that cons. came after RDF, right? Yes, so RDF uh, wa, um, uh, is a follow up to MCF. Yeah. MCF was the brainchild of Ramnath Guha, the guy who had a sample thesis on context. Yeah, they, they have been cool, I guess. yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then, uh, uh, but metadata uh, reference, uh, you know, so uh, I did a, um, I asked one of my students, uh, his name is Selvan. Silvam Well Gurugam, he was master student, so he's not in that list here. But to do uh, uh, a very interesting piece of work, you know, there is. Um, so let me see if I can um, bring it up. Uh, there is a list for master thesis to one your website. I'm sorry? There is a list of MS thesis, I think, on your website. On, on your website, there is a list of master students. Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. And, and uh, although the key are not picked over it, but yes. RDF was introduced around 2004 uh, or 2005. No, no, 1996. Um, in fact, my first paper on RDF was 1998. And uh, that is the, uh, I think that should be, um, uh, so when I did this system to structure to semantics, that involved, uh, you know, there is a companion paper of that, which was, uh, uh, which was an idea. So um, here is here was the idea that we did. Uh, very interesting. Let me see. I have a regret that there was one very powerful idea that we worked on that did not become very popular. And I think that it should have been, you know.
understand. Yes. So So um, in this work, uh, so related to the information is opening also. So you XML, you RDF, and then you have made a reference. So the idea is to uh, develop uh, correlation. Our DF is a relational data based format, right? Resource, resource, resource description. Resource description technology. Oh. It's a graphical, uh, you can think of it as a graphical model. What's the acronym stand for again? I was just about to Re talk. resource description framework. Resource description framework. And who's associated with that? Well, World Wide Web standard World for representing your okay. semantic okay. data. Okay. So basically, uh, uh, you have triple subject, predicate, object. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the model, uh, you know, uh, used in that context of semantic web data representation is uh, MREF. Oh, sorry, um, uh, uh, RDF. Okay. Uh, fundamentally, it is essentially graphical, you know, okay. model. And so the standard. The idea, they are not using subject predicate and logic. They are using some different terminology. Okay. Yeah, but it is it is same as subject predicate logic. Yes. Okay. Okay. What is the MRF? So MRF is a concept that I um, uh, defined, and and I'm very um, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, it's a point that, that it's going to become extremely important. So, you you know HRF, right? Yeah. I don't. Uh, HRF is uh, basically uh, link uh, in the uh, when you when you anything hypertext link. Okay. okay. Any anything that is underlined yeah. in green or in blue blue underline, the tag in the code is HRF. Okay. So it says that for this term. Go over there. on this web page. Like in a word document, you have to highlight something. So the idea of MRF was very simple. Uh, but um, what happened is so um, that I said that instead of HRF, you need to associate metadata to HRF. So not just the syntax, um, uh, go to this link for XYZ. What you got is simply that textual description. What if you actually describe where you're going in a metadata form? What is the reason for this? As a, in metadata. That would be a lot more meaningful. That is all. That was. And um, so I could what not. Is, Dr. Shad, what was the difference between this and uh, uh, the thing before MC? What is the difference between this and MCA? No, no. And, this uses so MRF uses RDF to describe the metadata. Okay. MCF is just a precursor to RDF. Okay. Uh, no, it was a kind of a proposal which then was standardized uh, as RDF. Just like Visual S was my proposal, which got standardized as a visual. Oh. My committee okay. effort. So is this like the info box? Yes. No, Infobox um, is a visual rendering outcome, as a, and this is more like Infobox would be like you know what happens when you click on a link, while uh, HRF is the code behind it. So MRF is the code behind it. That will could, could do something like. Is that data? I mean, I, I don't know that data. So how it used to happen? So you develop some idea. Then there was a dub 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 committee. You used to send it uh, to you know become a standard or something, and they approve uh, how this standardization used to work. Any standard is very complex and and, and long effort. So uh, I was uh, my my institution was a member of World Wide Web Consortium, and I was the institutional representative there. <coughs> um, uh, that provided me a bit more capability of taking the ideas to uh popularize uh, to their committee uh, to, to to the people at world wide web is uh, a community and the, and get their voting to say yes this is a good idea to now standardize and then you 
standardize it. So there was a, a concrete example is that I have um, these people. So I had this paper here called semantic sensor web. Now note this is it can come in just like you so the reverse. It's well cited. And then I said to World Wide Web, uh, there was a meeting at MIT, and you know about 300 people or 200 people were there. I say I uh, then I popularized saying. This sensor data, but um, the sensor data is low level, and we need to make it more meaningful. And hence, uh, it makes sense to have so many sensor web. So, other, you know, and I solicited others' interest, you know, sort of having coffee and all that. So, CSIRO, Austria, uh, their, their representative was there. He found, you know, uh, this would be very important for because they had a lot of use of sensors and all that. So then uh, uh, we uh, got co-chair of a committee. Uh, IoT group, right? Way before that. This is the ontology of sensor lab. Yeah, the, the, I'll show you that. This is the, the that's, this is the ontology paper. So this one also think of it as a uh, you know, uh, a position paper. Every time, you know, uh, with, with example and all that, it's an article. Uh, we popularized the idea. Then I proposed to World Wide Web that um, we want to, uh, you know, this there's a great need for supplying semantics. So under the World Wide Web concept, semantic web was a section. In that, this got, we got to uh, start a uh, 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 meet, uh, a group, it was then called because uh, they wanted to distinguish this term would be 100% associated with me, so we changed it to give them a very semantic sensor network. And this is before IoT, right? IoT was still not, you know, kind of. IoT was late. Yeah, so, so, so this is 2008, yeah. right? Yeah, IoT um, was, was getting um, sensors were there. And the, I don't know whether the word IoT was as high up or it came later. I think yeah. it became more popular a bit later. It was popular around 2014. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, mobile that's devices started coming. Yeah, at that time it was mm. very popular. But the sensor is same as IoT because the sensor is on a web. Hence, it's internet yeah. of things. So, uh, and, and my student, Cory Hansen, uh, took up the Task of and both of them are my students uh, of of uh, you know really doing the core technical work just like for visitors Mina uh, Kunal did the core, te core technical work anyway and that became a de facto uh, standard uh, in uh, called semantic sensor networking that is uh, and there is an ontology represent created for the semantic sensor networking standard which is this SSN ontology. And this is, um, you know, now of course there are a lot of people here to get them involved, so they are all there, and uh, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, number of things are there. Similarly, um, the uh, visual as when I came up with that, uh, there was a worldwide web um, workshop uh, in somewhere in Germany where uh, Ina presented uh, our proposal with uh, help of support of IBM. Committee was, uh, there were four proposals, ours was picked. I mean, people express most, you know, more interest in us. And uh, then the committee was formed. And then again, my students, uh, Kunal and uh, another person who Kunal mentored, his name is Karthik Gomadam. You see his name somewhere. So uh, he and uh, Meena, worked on that and uh, Mina Kunal and Karthik worked on that. We had to build a prototype for saying that this actually can be implemented all the stuff. That became SAV still SAV is the standard from um, so 
I mean, our group has had actual, you know, standardization come from our group, which is a huge achievement. I mean, international standards that are widely used, widely used. Okay, so going back to this is there or no? Yeah, so look at this paper, guys. But um, Anybody remotely wants to ask any question? Uh, Dr. Shath, how did you guys define the uh, concept of informative paths or things like that? What is an informative path? Okay. That is, we are coming to write that. So that is the work that came up for me. Uh, this is, um, so, um, that was her title. Uh, a great achievement for Pema for was that she got four interviews, all with tier one universities, and uh, got three offers and went to NCSU. Um, only place that did not give her an offer was Ohio State University. And there the faculty said, What is what, what is what is that? We don't consider this a uh, scientist. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, so Kema Ford did this series of work on semantic on, on, on um, semantic association. So I basically, um, <coughs> you know, again motivated by uh, concepts in, in applications. Uh, the year was. Um, uh, do you, you guys know I earlier talked about 9/11, uh, right? Uh, and my plane was on, uh, you know. Uh, uh, we landed in Dublin. Um, in those days, terrorism became main thing, and the follow immediately after 9/11, US came up with Patriot Law. One of the aspects of Patriot Law was that um, if somebody, uh, you know, money laundering was a big issue. So if somebody wants to open a bank account, you want to make sure that. The person is uh, is not engaged in any uh, bad activities. That led to Petit Law. One aspect of Petit Law was KYC. All of you have <laughs> come across KYC. That's that from there. Know your customer. What that requires is that you are a person or an entity trying to open a bank account. You need to make sure that this person is not engaged in any any nefarious activities like he, he does not have connection to let's say terrorist organization, organization or has not been implicated in any terrorist event or other things like that so there will be things like bank of england watch list there will be fbi watch list there will be you know various watch lists with it and uh, you need to this person may not have direct connection but may have connection to somebody else who has connected to somebody else and has connected to somebody else so that is the inspiration for me. I remember on a blackboard we had in our LSDIS lab uh, in University of Georgia. Um, you know, I said, here is the you know, graph and you need to find the path. So with that, we wrote a 2002 paper on semantic association. And then uh, uh, we had the 2003 paper uh, uh, involved in Kema Four. Uh, I believe both are 2005 papers. No, this one, okay. Okay. And uh, we discussed this somewhat, right? This is this paper in the 15 years. Article, I guess. Part computation. If it is about part computation. Okay. So, Rokai, every query for semantic question on the semantic web. So, RDF. So, here. This is 
we gave example of cultural thing because um, academic people did not like uh, terrorism examples. <laughs> This was a Snowden era, right? I mean, huh? This was a Snowden time. I mean, yeah. I mean, Snowden, I mean, no. become highlighted. The so US government have been, you know. Watched. Well, this was a time where there were uh, various, uh, you know, groups in Middle East. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so there were three major terrorism activity going on. There was one in uh, Philippines, one in Sri Lanka, very different kind, and another in Middle East. And, uh, you know, Middle East terrorism. So one very really interesting was. <coughs> How do you find from a very large amount of data people involved in terrorism in Middle East? And you do a search, then uh, how do you rank Middle East terrorism ahead of um, Sri Lanka, ahead, uh, sorry, uh, Philippines ahead of Sri Lanka? So this part ahead? was on web. Huh? This part was on web. Yeah. Your social media was not that. Not yet, no. no. It's around 2006, I think. This is 2003 paper. Okay. Yeah. So, so you are seeing Pablo Picasso, while on canvas, and uh, uh, you know in Reina Sofia Museum. So these are you know connections that you are trying to find within museum uh, and Rodin, uh, you know as a person. Uh, I, think, I I don't now remember all the details, but. Uh, for example, R1 and R6 uh, are both artists, even though of different kind and therefore are somewhat associated. Also, R1 and R6 could be said to be associated because they both have uh, cre creations that are exhibited at a museum. In this case, the association is that of a similar. Uh, here, so far, we are talking about relation in terms of direct path connected to entities and indirect path. So, okay, so you can uh, you go here. So, uh, how are resources R1 and R3 related? Such queries should return examples of R1 paints R2, which is exhibited in R3, indicating a path connecting two entities. So, these are the uh, you know, core type of results, and then there are a whole bunch of results that are weaker relationships. You know, the two things are similar, uh, and or they are they are um, displayed at the same location. Uh, the example I was giving the other day about you know a different kind of relationship. We are both in the United States, but that's much weaker relationship than in both are in AI Institute. That is weaker relation than uh, one is an advisor and advisee, right? So, uh, and then bringing those all these things up are uh, uh, you know um, issues. So this this paper does a formal definition of the meaningful path and uh, our systematic associations uh, using the RDF and uh, language. Um, and you see here the whole bunch of things. Um, at least worth scanning. Path, row path associated, row path uh, uh, joint associated, uh, uh, you know, so row, uh, uh, you know, joint property sequences. So there are many, you know, nuances and many aspects um, of um, uh, finding path. Path definition, row isomorphic property. So when there are two paths and they are uh, Parallel path, similar, you know, involving similar types of entity, right? So many aspects of those things are rows, iso associated, isomorphic, and so on and so forth. So this provides that you know, um, uh, four, uh, you know, definitions of that. This was followed by the paper. Um, on uh, this one here. So I told you that there are two uh, ranking uh, approaches. One was element Mesa's paper, and uh, this one is uh, that is more practical form of things, where the selectivity of a uh, you know a relationship was one of the factors. 
just like uh, you would do in a query optimization in relational databases. Here, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, she used a more formal uh, algorithm of, um, I think, uh, uh, I forget now. So, uh, how do you find, compute the path and rank them? This was a more uh, information retrieval based approach where um, she spoke about information gain and refraction and those sorts of things. Right, right. And uh, then the, the third paper, 2007. And uh, that one uh, is on query language, Spark 2L. So, query language sparkle extension to support our computation. So, these three formed core, you know, body of work that led to her dissertation. As soon as she graduated, she got recognized as a, um, um, you know, uh, significant force in semantic web, particularly focused on RTF query processing and uh, and uh, and optimization. So she made her name in that space. Okay. I need to wrap up now because of the time. Uh, oops, not that. Oh, I see. Dr. Sheet, so next week it's going to be uh, Dr. Das's NLP. Yes. So you're all done on it? No, I'm, I'm far from being done. But um, I, I felt it would be good to uh, go to a different direction for the time being, and get there and come back. So we'll come back to this uh, at some point, or, or immediately after him, if there is a time between if we go to uh, people AI. So uh, Matthew Perry did all the work in, uh, you know, uh, spatial temporal and thematic analysis. So adding to uh, RDF language, adding the temporal and spatial, uh, you know, query processing. So all the representation, query language extension, and computation. That was the uh, work of Matthew Perry. And uh, Angela's work followed came up first one. This one is, uh, you know, kind of follows Una and does the work in, uh, you know, essentially semantic web services. And he was involved both in a kind of later part of the uh, essay visual, but then he created another version of the uh, uh, semantic extension for REST protocols. So we define uh, um, uh, uh, what do you define? S, S, SRS, semantic assertion of RESTful services. And made a WTC submission. And then um, we did not carry through the actual formal standardization, but SRS is still there and recognized. Uh, and um, there are a couple of alternatives there too. Now comes uh, Satya's work, and I will discuss some of these things in more detail. Uh, Mena, Mena was the first thesis, to my knowledge, this was the first dissertation on social media. Uh, uh, I don't know if there's any, uh, you know, uh, in the US that was in, because the reason was that um, the social media data became available only in 2008 with Twitter. Uh, Facebook is older than Twitter, but uh, the data was not available, right? So you couldn't do much uh, work with that. So uh, there was, and then Pratik had, this paper had a 10 year award. Um, Ajit worked on cloud. Um, this one, uh, Christopher Thomas, he's the one who actually implemented Wikipedia tool. Uh, while he was on internship at, uh, you know, in Europe. It's a group that worked on that. And then comes Cori. And so there's some very interesting things that I will discuss before about Cori and the Roy. And, uh, uh, and then Hemant and all that. So we'll, we'll go on. So for today, I think this is enough.
let me stop the uh, recording. Any questions? Anything?